Welcome to Would You Rather, Tardive Dyskinesia or Diabetes. In this presentation, Tanya, Lisa, Brett, and I will be examining the cost and benefit of typical versus novel antipsychotic drugs. Psychotic disorders present debilitating symptoms and dysfunctions that disrupt major life activities. They require planning, services, and support in a variety of areas for an individual to experience an enjoyable quality of life. Before the introduction of typical antipsychotic drugs, the main treatment for individuals experiencing psychosis was institutionalization. Institutions consisted of undesirable living conditions with multiple individuals confined in small spaces filled with unsanitary conditions. Lack of attention to hygiene, minimal social interaction, and other less than desirable conditions were demoralizing to patients. Additional treatments for individuals included continuous water treatment, insulin shock therapy, and lobotomies. These treatments were painful, dangerous, ineffective, or accompanied by horrendous side effects. As an individual living with schizophrenia, the thought of being institutionalized for the remainder of your life was terrifying. The introduction of typical antipsychotics appeared to be an answered prayer for the incapacitating effects of psychiatric disorders. Medication was introduced in the 1950s. One of the first anti antipsychotics, Thorazine, was shown to dramatically improve the condition of patients affected by schizophrenia. For some patients, Thorazine controlled psychotic symptoms so well that many could live relatively normal lives. The introduction of typical antipsychotics started with excitement, but was soon followed with unbearable side effects causing the need for a new miracle. The novel antipsychotics were introduced in the 1990s. The first of these, clozapine, was marketed to be more effective than other antipsychotics due to the decrease in extrapyramidal side effects and the absence of sustained prolactin elevation. In addition, Pharmaceutical companies marketed the novel antipsychotics to treat not only the positive symptoms of schizophrenia, but also the negative symptoms as well. The novel antipsychotics were marketed as miracle drugs that would alleviate most symptoms with limited crucial side effects. However, such claims did not include longitudinal supportive evidence and side effects started to surface after long usage. The article Bitter Pill was published on January 28, 2009 as a controversial Rolling Stone article about Suprexa and Lilly, a pharmaceutical company. Lilly started marketing Suprexa for off-labeling purposes. While marketing, Lilly skewed data regarding excessive weight gain with the usage of Suprexa, resulting in many individuals to be diagnosed with diabetes at high, rapid rates. The shocking side effects were disregarded by Lilly and minimized by the FDA. During this period, Lilly spent $200 million on testing, which produced conflicting evidence, but was presented as conclusive reports. So, while earlier trials indicated that the SGAs had better efficacy and tolerability, but these studies were both short-term and included only highly selected patients, um, the debate about cost effectiveness and weight gain was ongoing. So two clinical trials without industry sponsorship were finally performed, and these were the Katie and Cutlass, and these tried to approximate more uh, clinical routine. CATI, which stands for the Clinical Antipsychotic Trials of Interventional Effectiveness, was done by the National Institute of Mental Health. It was an 18-month double-blind trial comparing the SGAs, Zyprexa, Seroquel, Risperidol, and Geodon with first-generation Trilophon. Um, improvement of psychopathology and quality of life was only moderate for all of them. Overall, 74% of patients discontinued the study medication before 18 months, and the median time to discontinuation was only 4.6 months. Aside from Zyprexa, which had a discontinuation time of 19.2 months, the other SGIAs did not differ significantly from each other or from Trilophon. Um, except for adverse side effects as the reason for discontinuation, what they specifically were, um, differences between the SGAs and FGAs was minimal. Um, when it comes to Cutlass, uh, which stood for the cost utility of the latest antipsychotic drugs in schizophrenia study, this was done by the UK's National Health Service. Um, it was a 12-month open trial label. Um, patients were randomized to receive an FGA or an SGA. Again, efficacy was rather similar between the two groups, with only limited improvement on psychopathology and quality of life. 
And the authors of both these studies um, concluded that the SGAs did not markedly differ from the FGAs in regarding compliance, quality of life, and effectiveness. Aside from the finding that the advantages of the SGA are not as strong as the early trials suggested and marketing suggested and promised, the trials do not provide much more helpful information as regards to everyday practice. There was one other study that was done, the UFEST. No, not a rock concert. It's a European first episode schizophrenia trial by the UK's European Group for Research in Schizophrenia. It wasn't technically funded by AstraZeneca and, and Pfizer, but um, the researchers did have ties to some of these companies. But still, it basically showed little difference in improving cognition in patients um, between the... Um, between the antipsychotics. A randomized trial showed that relatively low dose of Haldol FGA performed essentially as well as four SGAs, um, including am amrisulopride, which is not currently available in the, FD in the US, Cyprexa, Seroquel, and Geodon. In 498 persons 18, aged 18 to 40, had experienced psychosis for less than two years and had been exposed to antipsychotic drugs for less than two weeks during the preceding year and less than six weeks lifetime. So these are basically newbies as far as schizophrenia. Um, and substance abuse users were included. Five cognitive tests to measure overall recall, dexterity, processing speed, and concentration, and visual perception at the end of six months showed modest improvements in composite scores for all groups. So all these studies studied slightly different things, but basically they were consistent in showing that there was very little difference between these. So bottom line, Katie and UFES burst the bubble on the idea that the SGAs were superior in terms of cognition. I'm going to be talking about uh, typical first-generation antipsychotics, uh, which were major tranquilizers that were developed in the 1950s to treat psychosis and schizophrenia. Um, so uh, the side effects and the adverse side effects of typical first-generation medications uh, were tardive dyskinesia. Um, the likelihood of getting tardive dyskinesia actually increases substantially over time uh, when you're taking uh, typical first-generation meds. Um, symptoms uh, of TD are often irreversible. Um, you also could get prolactin elevation, uh, also have less substantial weight gain, uh, extra pyramidal symptoms, hypotension, uh, gastrointestinal disorders, Parkinson-like symptoms. Also, you could have heart rate drops, um, such as like uh, getting lightheaded, headedness, dizziness, or vertigo, and insomnia. You can get anticholinogenic effects. I hope I said that right. Ataxia, which is loss of coordination, dry mouth, blotchy red skin, increased body temperature, double vision, urinary retention, constipation, shaking, waking, and also neuroleptic malignant syndrome. Um, as far as atypical uh, second generation antipsychotic tranquilizing drugs, um, these new uh, generation of medications boasted lower side effects and claimed to have de de a decrease in the cause of extrapyramidal motor symptoms, um, which is the unsteady Parkinson disease type movement, such as tremors and body rigidity. Uh, these medications also stated that they lowered the risk of suicide and like all medications that they actually improve the quality of life a person has. Um, so what are the side effects of these new medications? Um, again, uh, tardive dyskinesia is coming up, but it may be too soon to tell in the long run. Um, Akesthesia, uh, this is described as unpleasant sensations of inner restlessness, uh, inability to sit still. In some cases, clients look like they're dancing or having moving feet. Uh, metabolic syndrome, which is a group of risk factors that occur together that increase the risk factors for stroke, type 2 diabetes, coronary artery disease, insulin resistance. Also, it can cause diabetes for people who don't have any typical risk factors. Um, also, as far as uh, it increases for diabetes up to like 36%. Um, who are prone to having diabetes, uh, hypertension, dyslipidemia, I think I said that, media. Anyway, um, increased obesity, increased difficulty in health management, especially for monitoring insulin levels, and also there's a higher risk of stroke, death, and uh, which is especially in elderly clients. This slide compares the cost of typical and novel antipsychotic drugs. 
The typical drugs can be purchased in a generic form and cost is relatively low. Currently, most of the generic for the novel drugs are not available within the United States, leaving costs to be extremely high. Taking into consideration that large numbers of individuals with mental health diagnoses live below the poverty level, the novel drugs are not an option if they work more effectively for individuals or not. So in summation, you know, what is more bearable for your client, tardive dyskinesia or metabolic syndrome? Tardive dyskinesia can be very debilitating and can be difficult to, for someone to get a job if they have this, um, but metabolic syndrome can kill you and can kill you pretty rapidly via a cardiac event or diabetes. Um, kind of in conclusion, um, no one size fits all with regards to antipsychotics. It's still often a process of trial and error, and it's sort of best for the professional to be monitoring the uh, patient closely and communicate regularly with, uh, with the, clients, uh, the client himself and the caregivers um, for both side effects and effectiveness in improving symptoms and symptomology. And also maybe for providers not to get overly excited with the newest and latest and greatest and to both use uh, read studies and that weren't and to pay attention to your patients and what they're saying. Okay, um, we as a group we highly encourage you to check out our resources. As you can see we have the Katie study which is a very interesting read, the Cutlass study, and also the UFES study, which is not uh, the rock and roll concert. And uh, we also, though, really highly encourage you to check out the Bitter Pill. Um, highly recommended, and uh, please check that out. Thank you for watching our PowerPoint. <laughs>